Because even when I feel pressure, sometimes fight is not the right thing to do. It's not. Sometimes the right thing to do is to get up, pack your shit, and be like, I'm out. With over a million views the last time she sat in this seat, my girl, Evie Pomporos, is back by popular demand. With a master's in forensic psychology, she was a former Secret Service agent and she worked complex undercover missions. So I I think it's safe to say she definitely knows a thing or 200 about controlling your emotions and staying calm under pressure. And she is here today to show us how. So please welcome the badass, no BS Greek girl from Queens who is defending presidents and taking names. The freaking badass, Evi Pomporas. Welcome, girl. Thank you for having me back. Of course. You have definitely had many, many pressures in your career. Um, I know that you were at the World Trade Center when um, the planes hit, so you want to talk about immense pressure um, and just other things that you have done. When I think about how we can help the world in situations when they're feeling pressure, whether it's they've lost their job or they're still stuck in quarantine, family pressures, you are to me the absolute freaking expert. So I want you to help us break down how on earth you stay calm under pressure, whether it's you find yourself at the Twin Towers or you find yourself being pushed by a seven foot Chinese delegate. It all depends on the situation because they're all so uniquely different. Like if you're talking about, since you brought up 9-11, if you're talking about that, that wasn't really just staying calm under pressure. For me, that was people are dying, which they were. And what can I do to help? I would not have been okay with leaving because they were evacuating our offices and they were evacuating the area. But for me intuitively, like I couldn't leave. Like I wasn't comfortable with leaving. You know, and this is how I feel like we're all like family out on this earth while we're here. And I was like, my brothers and sisters are out there dying. I'm, where am I gonna go? So that's, I feel for me, yes, there was pressure there, but that's where that came from. So because of the passion I felt in helping other people, I didn't really think about anything else. And so that was dri my driving force. So I think sometimes like, what is your driving force? So for me in that moment, it was helping save another human being's life or mm -hmm. save, hey, helping save other people's lives. And so I just let my humanity guide me. And I just stayed to, to help. Also in the back of my head, I'm like, I'm a special agent. Why would I leave? Hmm. I'm like, this is my job is to help protect people. Where am I going to go? Like I'm the last person that should leave. There's pressure there. But again, like I let my humanity drive me with that one, you know, other people suffering. And I was like, I want to be part of the solution. I don't want to leave. Now that, that in of itself is pressure. You could also look at other situations that are maybe not as ex extreme as September 11th, like pressure you feel maybe, you know, your safety or your protection or protecting somebody else like in a physical way or fear or fear of threat. Like when you feel those types of pressures, I feel that it's really important to know like how you typically react and knowing what you will do when you're in a press, mm. a pressing situation. Like you have to know your, I call it the F3. You have to know what your reaction is. You call it the what, sorry? The F3. F3. Fight, flight, freeze. Right. And so are you a person that when you feel threatened or pressured, do you immediately want to fight? Do you, do you freeze up because you don't know what to do because you become overwhelmed? Or do you flee? A lot of people flee bad situations when they feel pressures. They, they hide, you know, they go into the fetal position, whatever it is, they, they retract. So I think it's really important to know like which persona you, you embody. Mm -hmm. And you'll see, you'll, you, you'll typically have a pattern that you have. Mine's always fight, it's always been fight. Most people will have one. Yours is definitely fight. <laughs> it definitely is. Yours is fight. <laughs> so this is when you kind of go at it. So if I know that typically that's what I'm going to go into, I use that to help guide me. Because even when I feel pressure, sometimes fight is not the right thing to do. It's not. Sometimes the right thing to do is to get up, pack your shit and be like, I'm out. Are there things in that allow you to identify in those types of pressures which act to do? Because you said your instinct is to fight, but sometimes that isn't the right answer. How do you then in that moment identify actually this moment of pressure doesn't mean I should fight. It actually means I need to It depends. Flee. It's like, are we talking about threat? 9-11 is a threat. Right. That's a whole other thing. I guess when Getting... I was thinking of 9-11 though, I was thinking of it like in a moment where I, I feel like the world is coming down around me. Obviously for you, that was literal. 
but the pressure of having to make a decision when you're shit scared, right? Like in that freaking moment where you feel like the world's coming down around you, where maybe you can't take a deep breath, like how do you, if you don't have a clear mind, how do you make a clear decision? Okay, there's two things to, you, you, we listen to. We listen to our gut, our, that, that, that feeling, that thing we have, and then there's the logic. So it's like you hear things from two places, up here, the mind, right? Which is typically negative sometimes, but it's a little bit more rational. And then you hear things from here, like where you feel that intuition that you follow. 9-11 was complete intuition. I didn't listen to this, I listened to this. And I let that guide me. But it was very clear and definitive, definitive to me. Like I, I knew what I was supposed to do. Like it, I didn't sit and debate it. Do I leave? Do I? It was very clear to me, mm -hmm. despite the pressure. Now, sometimes when we feel pressure, whether it's an emotional pressure, relationships, work pressures, it's like, first, can you can you figure out what's guiding you? If you can feel this, that that essence, that guide that pulls you, follow that. But make sure it's not coming from here, and also make sure it's not coming from like rage or anger. Sometimes when we go into our heads, we become very negative. We overthink. Overthinking stresses out more, gives us more anxiety. So if you find yourself in that space where you're like, oh my God, this is happening. Oh my God, that is happening. That's your brain doing that. And so finding proper coping, coping mechanisms. When I feel extreme stress, I step away. Because I've, got, I've been in those moments where I can't, I can't think right. Or I'm seeing red. Like I'm not, I'm not immune to that. I want to meet a, meet a person who is immune to that. But when I'm in that space, when all I can see is red, I can't hear, I can't think. I don't type it. I don't text it. I don't email it. I don't call. I do, I do nothing. I do nothing. In fact, my brother was dealing with a really stressful situation recently. And he's like, what do I do? I'm like, nothing. <laughs> do nothing. Because he wanted to respond to someone. And he was so overwhelmed. He took a sticky pad with a marker and he wrote, do nothing <laughs> and he pulled off the sticky pad and he put it on his computer and he's like i'm gonna look at that for the next 24 hours mm. because he felt so impulsive to react because he was under such pressure and he called me later he's like i'm looking at the sticky pad i'm doing nothing i'm doing nothing because we have to let that sensation that mo emotion over just let it run its course so you come from a place of tranquility if you're in an upheaval how can how can you how can you respond so that's the first thing I do. 24 hours is minimum. Sometimes I'll wait a week before I respond to mm -hmm. someone. I, I, I put me first. Because it, just because it's your emergency, it doesn't mean it's my emergency. Says who? Have you always been like that? Or did that develop over time? Developed over time. Because we feel instinctually, this person emailed Correct. me this. This person said this to me, I have to respond. Why? That's their emergency, it's not yours. How did you get to thinking like that then? Probably Secret Service broke me down quite a bit. Really? Because in the service, you have people yelling or screaming or they're attacking or they're, you're arresting someone or so many things are happening and you got to keep it together. Like you, you can't just, you just can't respond and not be thoughtful in it. You, they, you're also taught to be quite de decisive. Mm. And that was one of the best things. I think indecisiveness is a very dangerous thing. Indecisiveness causes us to look to others to give us advice. It causes us to not make decisions in life. Indecisiveness keeps us paralyzed. And decisiveness is bad for our self-esteem and our confidence. Being a decisive person is important. I'm gonna do this right or wrong, I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. And then you learn from there and it, it really grounds you. So that, that was a key thing. But as far as like pulling back and not responding, that came from there. It's like, I can't respond the way other people respond. Like I would have if I was dealing with the public, sometimes the public doesn't behave right. I, I can't mimic that. Mm. So if, if, if somebody in the public is escalating, I have to be very careful. I'm like, I can't escalate with them unless I strategically need to escalate with them because I'm in a position of where I can take another human life or I can take somebody's freedom away. Mm. So I had to be very, very in, in, have composure. But I also went through a really thorough screening process to get into an agency like that. I went through a, quite a bit of training. So what they did is they put us in a lot of stressful situations. And the mindset was, if you can't control the stress in this controlled environment, how are you gonna control yourself out on the street? But you don't become this person overnight. I didn't become this person overnight. This is, this is work. It still is work. There's still moments where I'm like, what the? You know, and I'm like, I, I will stop. I'll put music in. Mm -hmm. 
I'll, I'll go run. I, 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 I have my tool bag and I pull from my tool bag and I'm like, I'm going to do this to get me to stop. Or I'll listen to an audiobook. I'm a huge fan of audiobooks. I'm going to take my mind and transport it somewhere else. Or I'll go surfing. I'll go, I, I interrupt myself. And we talked about it last time, disruptors. Mm. Because so I can come back to a place where I'm not stressed out. Another thing I do is like, I almost, I, I call it like I bubble wrap myself from people. Because what you can do is you, I can become really heightened and thrown off by somebody else's chaos and energy. So if somebody is like all over the place and angry and freaking out, what happens? We, we escalate with them. Mm -hmm. And I recognize that I've been, I've taught myself to recognize that. And I'm like, they're escalating because they've got something going on up here. Don't go with them. So I stay. Remember once I did this interview with this young man and um, I was interviewing him for a job actually. I used to do the polygraphs in the US Secret Service. To get the job, you had to take a polygraph and you had to pass it. And I gave him uh, a polygraph and we got into the topic of, I wanna say it was either drugs or a criminal history. There was something he was hiding. I believe it was drugs. And we were talking about his experimentation and usage. And the whole interview, he's sitting there, he's super composed. And then the moment I got into this topic, I started seeing his behavior shift. And he started just rocking back and forth in his chair. And then he just goes rocking. And then I keep moving into the, the, the conversation, asking more in-depth questions, and he's rocking harder. Then I see him start scratching himself, mm -hmm. and I see all these blotches of red. And I immediately notice, I'm like, he's having some kind of breakdown right now because this is stressing him out. It's likely it's stressing him out because he's about to lie to me or he lied on his paperwork because there is something there. And I remember he jumps out of his chair and he starts ping-ponging back and forth in the room, completely stressed out as he was talking to me. At that point, I stopped. And I remember like my chair had wheels on it and I wheeled myself back. I didn't get up out of the chair. Mm. I didn't mimic his demeanor because it would only escalate with him and I would also escalate myself. I let him go through whatever he was going through. I maintained my composure and eventually I was able to calm him down. But this is with anything else. D don't, I don't let other people pull that part out of me. I, I decide when it comes out. And so I'm just very mindful. This person's having an emergency. It's not my emergency, it's theirs. Mm. When we talk about pressure, when we talk about self-esteem and sticking up for yourself, like all these subjects, I honestly think you're the freaking expert because you've got actual training. And so this, it's so powerful. But then once you bring emotion in it, right, it becomes slightly different. So, but I also mess up. I've messed up. Right, which I think is amazing. That's the thing. Like I've, I don't know how many times I've messed up. Mm -hmm. And so, but I, it's when I've messed up that I'm like, man, I shouldn't have done that. Man, I shouldn't have said that. But I, this is the, di the, the difference. I choose to learn from it. Mm -hmm. And I choose to make it a lesson, whereas other people are like, yeah. And then you wonder why you're messing up all over the place. Mm -hmm. Like I, 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 I look at things and I assess things and I, I'm truly honest with myself. Like every night I say, to, I say to myself one thing, what could I have done better today? What could I have done differently today? Because... I, I take accountability, and when I take accountability, man, I flow. But when I, I'm, when I don't, I hit walls. I, 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 I understand that I don't know everything. And is that because you know yourself so well? Because what I love is, and I think this is why we get along so well, we think very similarly. Like, I'm the same. It's like, what can I do better? Because it empowers me to do better. But I know a world where a lot of people, even asking that same question at the end of the day, a lot of people in this space that I've also interviewed have said, I always say like, it's okay, Lisa, like, what did you do great today? And it's self-soothing. And I actually understand that part of it, but I'm like you as well. I also have the other side that at the end of the day, I'm like, what could you have done better? How do you use that to empower yourself and not to shame yourself for doing things wrong? No, I don't shame myself. So then, how, yeah, tell me, how no. does that so not I can, feel shame? But you can be both. You can be like, what could I have done better? And it's like, okay, I could have done this better. I messed up and I will say to myself, that's okay. So mm -hmm. what? Mm -hmm. I do, you can do, you can be both. You can hold yourself accountable and be like, I messed up. Who hasn't? Who hasn't? And it's all right. It's like, all right, you messed up. Move on. Yeah. And there needs to be no shame yeah. because it's so important the way you talk to yourself and treat yourself and speak to yourself. Like I wouldn't tolerate somebody else being like shame on you. So why would I shame myself? 
I understand and take accountability. I messed up. I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have said this. If I need to apologize to someone, I will. It's very rare now. <laughs> but I will own it. I will own it. Like if you're going to a relationship, like if I argue with my, my significant other, or even with my mom, I go back and I'm like, you know what? I'll, in that moment, I'll be like, I was right. And then five hours later, I'm like, no, I didn't need to do that. I'll go and I'll say, I'm very sorry. So I really think apologizing is good. But then you also don't want to get into this mindset where you're constantly apologizing for how you feel and who you are. Mm. Apologize when you need to. But that mindset and that language also pulls you back into this subordinate place. Apologies are important when you need to apologize. But when you don't, like if I argue with my significant other, I'll be like, I'm not apologizing for this one. Mm. Not because I'm right, but because it's not, the situation isn't right. And I want to address this with you. I will hold it. God, I love that. And I, um, I want to actually talk about verbal currency is what you call it, I think. Verbal economics. Uh, ver ver yeah, verbal economics. Um, because I'm so with you. So even with my husband as well, we literally have this language where he's, he will say, or I will say to him, I'm sorry I've hurt you, but I'm not sorry about what I said. Like what I said, I actually still mean. And if I apologize for what I said, then it seems like I don't actually mean it. Now, I'm sorry I hurt you. And I'm sorry that, um, like, what words can I maybe change that didn't hurt you? But my point is still the same. And if I feel strongly in the point, I don't want to apologize for it because then it seems like I'm kind of backtracking out of emotion, right? Because like, oh, I've hurt him, so I'm sorry. Um, and I actually don't think that solves any issue. No, but I think what you're doing is right. But you also have to acknowledge that you did something, whether you like it or not, Correct. whether you agree with it or not, it upset him. So it's not Correct. like, well, I didn't mean it that way. Well, it doesn't matter how you meant it. This is how I took exactly. it. But sometimes I will apologize because I'll be like, I'm sorry we fought or yeah. I'm sorry for what I said or I'm sorry for my behavior um, because I, I am hot-headed. And, you know, usually it's to the people closest to us that we... We'll keep our composure mm -hmm. out in public typically or with work and it's we lose it at home. And that's no good either because that's how you lose people. That's how you hurt people. Like we're not, you're not meant to come home and dump on people. And that's something to be very careful of. So I came from a very high stress environment. And even after I left the service, working in television, in the industry, like there's so much stress. I had to be very mindful of that, to take that out on the people I go home to. They're not there to be your dumping ground. Because at some point, like, you're going to affect them and then you're going to end up like, where is everyone? Everyone left you because you're, you're, you're dumping all your stuff on them. Like, they have a day. They, they're going through. Their, everyone's going through something. And so self-assessment is such a huge thing. And, I, you know, I go by, like, I'm not always right. Humility is a big thing. Like, people need to have that. I don't know where that's gone. Everyone knows everything. Everybody's super self-righteous. Like, have some humility. You don't know anything. None of us do. Oh, oh what is Socrates? It was uh, Socrates, I believe, said this. He said, I know I'm smarter than you because I know I don't know everything. <laughs> and that's how I feel. And so when I feel people going, 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 like that self-righteousness or that, like, I know everything, like, tune out. Mm. I'm like, okay. I do the head nod. I'm like, so great talking to you. I'm going to go do business elsewhere. I'm going to go hang out elsewhere. And I'm really, like, thoughtful about the inner circle I, I I keep because I want to grow as a human being. And if I keep negativity and people who don't control themselves well, and that's another thing as far as pressure, be around people who, who handle pressure well so you can learn from them. I watch other people. Do you know, working in the White House, that was a huge, like it was, it was going to like school every day because I would watch the presidents, the first ladies deal with serious pressures. And I'd watch how they handle themselves, and I'm like, note to self. Yeah. They would, they would deal with horrible messages or emails or hate or all these different things, and they would wake up, and the president of the United States, he still has to go to work. He still has to run the country. He can't just sit there and fall apart. You have to keep yourself composed. But at the same time, they surround themselves by what? Other people who help keep them strong. That's, you have a cabinet. And so I look at myself as like, I'm not the president, but in my mind, I'm like, I'm me. Who's my cabinet? Who are my cabinet members? And who do I go to when I need help? So if I'm about to like do something or say something, I may call you, Lisa, and be like, Lisa, man, I just had this business thing. I know this is your space. I'm like, I'm about to lose my shit. Can I talk to you? So I'll, I'll do it with you. 
so I don't do it elsewhere. But I'm mindful of where I project that. Now, I'm mindful not to dump on you, but I'll go to you because I feel like you, you're the, you know the space. Mm. Teach me. So I think that there's so many different outlets. It's like assessing yourself, surround yourself with strong people. If you're around people who like lose their shit, guess what you're going to do? Lose your shit and don't mimic other people. When they escalate, don't, don't, don't follow the lead. Don't follow. I get trapped in that all the time. I really do. I've noticed that about me. I keep calm. I keep calm. I keep calm. But then like after a certain moment, like if someone keeps escalating, I keep calm. I'm like, Lisa, you're doing good. You're doing good. People escalate. Lisa, it's okay. You're doing good. And then they just keep escalating. At some point, I freaking just but like... But when you, when you escalate, what do you do? Do you yell? Do you, what do you do? Yeah, my, I, my tone gets louder. My voice gets louder. I get harsher. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, I've been in spaces like that. When I feel that, I really remove myself. I go, I go, I go yeah. quiet. So you said something earlier, like, I go silent. When I can't keep composure, I go silent. Mm. If I disappear from someone's life, mm. I'm done. Or I've gone silent. Like, I'll remove myself or even the situation and I'll come back. But if I can keep composure, like, I will assert myself. Like, you have authority. Assert it. And authority doesn't mean being a jerk. Mm. Authority doesn't mean being condescending. And in fact, authority is a strong influence tactic. When you are perceived as an authority in something people will acquiesce to you more. This is why we acquiesce so much to, to doctors, because we see them as authority, law enforcement because they've got a uniform on, financial advisors. So many people acquiesce to them because we see them as an authority. Meanwhile, like they could have graduated at last in their class. And so, but when you assert yourself as an authority in body posture, in voice, in speech, in how you present yourself, people are less likely to mess with you. So from the onset, like I had to learn this a lot in the interview room when I would interview people who were criminals, who would see me and be like, oh man, this is going to be an easy day. Because I, I worried about that initially, mm. but I controlled that from the moment I met that person, from the moment I met them, from the moment. Break it down. What do you mean by that? Hi, how are you? I'm Evie Pompurus. Nice to meet you. And if I wanted to throw in special agent, I freaking would. Hi, I'm special agent Pompurus. Nice to meet you. Come with me. Now, granted, this was an interview environment, but I set the tone. Now this person understands that I, she's an authority here. I establish myself as an authority. And that's really, really important. So I won't be passive. Passive is no go because that, that builds up and then you blow up on people. But if I'm also dealing with someone who's like, I'm sorry, a buffoon, I'm done dealing with you. I will minimize my detailing, my, my, my dealing with you. I'll deal with you via email if I have to. I'll pull back. I'll have my manager deal with you. I'm like, hey, I don't want to talk to this guy. This guy's a bozo. I know I got to work with him. Can you handle him? Talk to me about that because I'm such an um, advocate for like words matter. The words you use for yourself and um, the words you use to others um, can signify either with yourself that you're inferior or um, superior. Um, and then to others, whether you feel, because like you said, right, authority. So the language that you use in order to express the authority, I assume, is extremely important. Um, what are the things that you feel make all the difference in that situa in situations? So verbal economics is actually it didn't come from me. It came from my one of my former colleagues, Lee, who's a great interviewer and negotiator. And he said, he we talked about language, and he said, he turned the coin because we were talked about how important it is the words we use because we would be very mindful of the words we use when we would talk to people because certain words can put people off and sort you know make them shut down and other words can invite them in and make you appear more open and they communicate with you more so he would call it verbal economics meaning we live in a time where we think i have to say everything i'm thinking mm -hmm. like i was mentoring this woman once she's like you know i talk really fast because i'm trying to get everything i'm thinking out of my mouth and i'm like why? Choose what you let out. Not every idea that pops into your head should you verbalize. Because when you do that, you're not putting weight into your words. So verbal economics means choosing your words thoughtfully. And then what you're about to say, think of it as money. Right. And the more powerful and impactful the words, the more money you're putting down. It's currency that you're using with another human being. And if those words you're using have currency, have weight, they're going to impact that person more. But if you're just like spewing out everything you're thinking, 
there is no currency there because nothing is really truly a value. Mm. Look, it's going to happen where people and things are going to come out the wrong way or say the wrong thing. But when you can slow it down and really use this, this mindset of verbal economics, my words matter and they have weight, that they impact another human being in some way. And it can impact them in a positive or negative way. And it can also impact me whether what I get from that relationship is positive or negative. So how do you start assessing which are the high dollar bills and the low dollar bills? It depends on the situation. Like with, I talk about priming a lot in the book. Mm. And priming is you can prime people to, to be more open with you. And it's actually a good negotiators, good people who do business. Before you do a pitch, we used to have the saying, even in the interview room, your opening line, you should always write that thing down. That should be rehearsed. You should never fly by the seat of your pants. That opening line is going to be the defining, the defining moment and how the rest of your conversation is going to go. Mm-hmm. So like priming words, you know, hi, I'm Evie. It's so nice to be here. Thank you for having me. I, I can't wait to talk to you about the partnership and create an open relationship and an honest one where we can cooperate together. Now in there, I threw in priming words, open, cooperative relationship. So I'm priming you to want to work with me to create this open environment. You can also do that with your environment as far as like having open space, letting people not feel closed in. You can prime situations and people, talking to people, uh, man tables. Like I like I could teach people who do interviews or talk to people like, and you do, you're solid, you have open space here, but people do negotiations and they have tables between them. Biggest 101 fundamental, never negotiate with somebody with a table between you two. I, I, I taught this interviewing thing for realtors on how to sell better. I did a speaking presentation and they work so hard to like get people to connect with them, to sell them like property and all this stuff. And then they go to sit down to do paperwork. And what do they do? You worked all this time to build this rapport. And the minute you sit down at the table, you just killed it. Cause now it went from an informal, Hey, we're buddies to like, all right, sit down and do business and think about moments. Somebody sits down and does business. What do everybody do? They straighten up. Okay we're going to do business now. Okay, I'm going to do my interview now. I don't want that guy or gal. I want the person before. I want my buddy. And you have a table. I've heard you say the table and you can't actually see their body and the whole point is to read no. people's body language. Oh yeah, how can I read somebody's? One, tables work as barriers. Right. So they are psychological barriers. There's me and then there's you. Even I teach. I have a podium. I never stand behind my podium. I come mm. out from the podium. I walk through the aisles of my classroom because I let my students know, hey, it's not me and then you. Right. It's us. I'm here with you. Are we doing dates wrong then? Because people go on dinner dates. No, for a date, you don't know this dude or guy. Like, you want to have some space between you. Ah. Like, me walking through the aisle and having a couple of feet between me is different. When you're sitting at a table, what are you talking about? One to two feet? Not on a date, like, I would be super thoughtful, especially if you don't know somebody. Like, first dates, especially using apps or whatever, you really got to be mindful about who you meet. Public places, the first few dates. Definitely have some space, monitor that space like between you and that person. Don't give personal information. Don't have them come pick you up at your home. I know I just went on a tangent with this, but I have so many people ask me about this and I'm like, you, get a little bit of be, you have to be really careful. Don't trust unconditionally. Like you don't know people. Mm. I really like that because if you know that you're about to put yourself under pressure, whether it's a date or whether it's a job interview, or whether it's something else, having these tactics of like, how far to sit from someone. Like I think about a lot of things, I don't even think about that or like how that would impact you. But I think about, this is what happens. When you're under pressure, you think about who? Yourself. Mm. And that's all you're thinking about. Me, 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 I, 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 I'm under pressure, I'm under this. And you're not thinking about the person across from you. One of the ways I deflect pressure to for myself is I'll think about that person. I forget about me that I'm gonna present, I'm gonna speak, I'm going on camera. And what I do is to relieve the pressure off of me, I'm like, what does that person want? And so when I can focus on who the recipient is, I forget about myself. So that is truly another tactic. Like I just shot something, a uh, project here, and you know, I wanted to make sure I did a really good job when we were shooting. And I took it back to like, I'm delivering something for the viewer, someone who, something somebody's gonna see. And so that's what matters. So I took myself out of it. I'm nervous, I'm, I wanna do a good job, me. And I made it about them. What do they need to see? What do they need to hear so that it feels impactful and authentic? And that takes, that distracts me from me. But if you're presenting something, so to speak, be prepared. 
Like a big part of pressure is not being prepared. And if you're prepared, that's one less thing you have to worry about. If you got on the right outfit, that's one less thing you have to worry about. Mm. If your hair and makeup are done in the same, in the way you, you feel confident, that's one less thing you have, you have to worry about. So I look at it as columns. Let's say I'm nervous about something, right? I'm nervous about speaking because I'm just nervous and I, the pressure of speaking. So here's that column, speaking. I'm like, all right, here's where I have a struggle, but where, what other columns can I control? Well, I can control what I wear, so I feel good and strong and I can control how I look, and I can control how much I prepare, and I can control my prior linguistics, my voice, my speech, my rate. I can tr so I'll check all these other boxes where here, it's like, all right, here I'm still kind of flailing a bit, but I control all these other things. Because you can go into a situation, and then again, going back to my previous career, where we would go into situations, have all these protocols in place, but in the end, I don't know how someone's going to respond or react or if there's going to be an attack or whatever it's going to be but i controlled all these other verticals i'm prepared i'm wearing I'm, i've got my gear on i've got my shoes on that i need to run or fight with or whatever my hair's pulled back i'm confident i got a good night's sleep whatever i need to do i checked all those boxes so that when something does break bad or there's pressure i'm i'm, I'm good here i just got to worry about here i love that god every time i talk to you like the thing that always just screams so much is you just take ownership. You take ownership over your actions. You take ownership over the outcomes. And I heard you in your book talk about taking ownership over the outcome. And a lot of people give, I like to say, give away their power by saying, but this person advised me, this person told me to do this. And so they're giving away their ownership over the situation. But I've heard you talk about like, no, even if other people give advice, it's on you. Um, talk to me about that. Have you always felt like that? Um, how do you do that? And how do you do that? And not going back to the shame thing, take ownership over it, but not shame so yourself. I it. love what you just said, because what you said is exactly right. What a lot of people do is we'll blame other people because we think we're protecting ourselves. I'm going to blame this person because I don't want it on me. But what you don't realize is in the long term, you do damage to yourself because that becomes your default. And now nothing is your fault and everything is everybody else's fault. And then nothing's going to work out for you. And you give your power away. When I blame other people, I do the exact same thing. And I came from an agency where they're like, I don't, they don't, they don't want to hear excuses. Mm -hmm. Save your excuses. So I was also groomed like, own your shit. You make a mistake, own it. You make a mistake, fix it. Nobody wants to hear it. Find out what it is. Fix what it is. And then that way you can move forward, forward and excel. You make yourself more insecure. And you hit your own confidence when you do that, when you blame other people. Because you're saying all these people have control over me. Mm -hmm. I have no control over my fate or what happens. I'm the captain of my ship. So I'm going to steer the direction it goes. And if a wave comes and it knocks me over, then I'm going to fix my ship and steer another way. I love that so much. And that, so I've been, as you know, been suffering with health issues for five years. And for the first three years, I was going to all the doctors waiting for them to fix me but over time i figured out what was wrong with my gut and there was um, abuse on antibiotics i was getting sick a lot and so i was blaming the doctors it's the doctors fault they were giving me too many antibiotics i shouldn't have been having too many they were just prescribing it and i was then going to the doctors to fix me then the ownership thing came in i was like hang on a minute if i say that it's on them that caused this how can I then take ownership over fixing it? But if I flip my mind and say, Lisa, this was you. The doctors didn't force antibiotics down my throat. I swallowed them myself. The doctors would say, you know, I probably shouldn't give you this many antibiotics. Never once did I say, why? Never once did I sit there with Google and go, what is the worst thing that can happen if I take too many antibiotics? And once I realized that, I was like, wow, this is all my fault and that's amazing because now I can fix it. Now I'm not waiting for the doctors to fix me. And immediately I started going to biohacking. I got like glucose level monitors. And, and, and since then, over the last two years is when I've finally been able to make change. Do you realize that, this is, this is profound for me. Do you realize that you were taking these medications and not questioning anybody? Why? Authority. Yeah. A oh, doctor gave it to yeah, you. Yeah. Oh, he yes. must know. He must know. Well, if he's telling me to take it and we don't question, it's like, oh, okay, doctor, the doctor told me to do this. The doctor told me to do that. But you're choosing to put it into your body. Mm -hmm. Like we have no sense of like, like responsibility over ourselves. You, 
are responsible, like I am responsible for myself. So whatever happens to me, happens to me because I choose certain things to some degree. Like I choose, like I have a choice and like I monitor that decision. And if I choose wrong, I chose wrong. Mm -hmm. Rather than like this person, this. If I could say one of the things that, I don't wanna say it's a pet peeve, but one of the things that disappoints me sometimes with folks is like when I hear excuses and I'm like, why are you blaming everyone else for everything? Like life is being done to you. You're not, you're not doing to life. You're not experiencing life. You're not, you're not doing it. It's being done to you. Everything is being done to you. And it's so easy to get into that mindset. Mm -hmm. Right, because mo a lot of the time excuses are valid, like they're valid, right? If you were to come to me and you were like, oh my God, I just got robbed. And you're like, this guy, he was like seven fur and I didn't see him coming. And so all of these things like, you know, and let's say they robbed you. But if you had said, I put my, oh God, this is a terrible situation. In fact, I don't want to be victim blaming and I worry that I'm about to go down a whole victim blame thing. There's actually something called victimology. Really? Yes. What's victimology? Uh, victimology is when we look at people who have been victims of crime to see if there's certain patterns and the, w there's, there's certain things that make somebody either more or less susceptible to crime and lifestyle is one of them. And so your lifestyle can impact you. It's not about blaming. Mm. It is lifestyle choices. How do you separate the two then? Well, it's about assessing. So it's like if I go out and I get drunk and I'm with a friend and my friend leaves me, I can either blame my friend for leaving me if something happens to me. I could be like, I went out, I chose to get drunk. Part of that's on me because I didn't have a proper plan in place mm. to make sure I had the right friend, to make sure maybe I didn't go out and get drunk. I, growing up, I avoided drinking. I grew up in New York. And there's a lot of bad things happening out, but I wanted to go out and be young and experience a nightlife. So I chose, I'm like, I'm gonna cho choose to have my wits about me, but I can still go out. Mm -hmm. And so I avoided drinking because I wanted to make sure nothing happened to me. That helped, helped me stay safe to some degree. Or, you know, working out at night, like I, you, I've expressed this to you, I work out at night and I go running at night, but I will make an assessment. I'm like, oh man, it looks really desolate here tonight. I'm not going to go. So victimology is about looking at patterns. And then the findings in the research of victimology also show that if somebody's victim of one crime, that they potentially are victimized multiple times. So usually you're not a victim once, but multiple times. And I think that's a really good thing to look at, not just when we're talking about crime or something being happened to you, but in life. So if you see that you're constantly being victimized by people, right? This person took advantage of me, then this person, this person did this to me. So if you're constantly in that victim space, ask yourself, what am I doing to let people think that they can do this to me? There's something I am doing or not doing that lets people think that they can treat me this way, that they can take advantage of me. And then being honest with yourself to change that. Go, I so freaking hope people hear that. Like I really do, because if you can, if anyone that's listening or watching can take their, their emotion out of it and just listen to what you're saying, it's so empowering. Like it's so freaking empowering. Um, and that's what I'm always about. Like how do we look at situations that can be seen or are freaking negative and go, how can I use this to empower myself for next time so that I'm not a victim or you know that I can at some point, right? Like you've said many times, you can't control other people. You can't control if someone's going to attack you. But I've even heard you say about like a breakdown of attack where they look at people who have their guard down. Oh, they, there was a study done where they look at offenders, violent offenders. They ask them like, how do you pick who you're gonna target? And they say, oh, I just, body language. I would just assess the person. And they pick targets that look easy, distracted on their phone, not paying attention, squeamish, poor body posture you know, not paying attention, whatever it is, if the person looks like they're gonna go down easy, then that's who they pick. They don't want a fair fight. Bullies don't want a fair fight. Mm -hmm. they don't, they're not looking for their equal. They're looking for people that they can take over and abuse. That's why children are constantly being uh, victimized because they're the least able to take care of themselves. And so that's why you see so much of that. But that's what bullies and predators do. Fight back, speak back, walk away. Like you have choices, you have choices you said in relationships as well that, that kind of threw me i was so thinking of you know um but people that's find so themselves in really bad relationships and abusive relationships 
and they'll, you know, and they'll say, I can't leave. It's like, I know I'm oversimplifying this, but you have, you're also making a choice to endure what you're enduring. I'm not saying it's right. No, look, this is one of those super sensitive subjects. And the reason why I wanted to do the show right from the beginning is talk about the hard things, not to make anyone feel badly, but honestly, to freaking empower them. My end line to every episode, right, is be the hero of your own life. And so while this is a very difficult subject for us to talk about, I'm actually very um, proud that we can talk about it. And I really, really do hope that people hearing and watching this see what we're trying to get to. Um, I want to echo, we are not victim blaming, we are not, but you are giving people strategies and tactics that I really freaking hope if someone watches this show today and they heard you, Evie, and because of that, they make a change. They don't get drunk in a situation or whatever it may be, and you may have just saved them. So it's important to talk about this. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, and I just want to be honest too. Like I'm not unscathed. I'm not without scars. Like I've heard, learned hard lessons as well. Like I'm not completely bulletproof. I've had situations happen to me, bad relationships happen to, happen to me, bad situations. I was victimized too, but I also like maybe made certain decisions or there was points where I could have chose differently or done something differently. But, and I chose, I'm like, I'm not going to be here anymore. Mm -hmm. It's not an easy thing. I'm not simplifying it. But when I say this, and I think what you're echoing is super important is like to give power back to that person. It's like, you know what? Don't let yourself be in that victim mentality. Know that you have power. And when you feel power and you feel strong, then you can make powerful choices. But when you live in that victim space, and when somebody pushes you to live in that victim space, like you, have a, you can make the choice to say, I'm not going to live here anymore in this way. And how you go about it is up to you. Look, training definitely enhanced that for me. Because I did come from in a place where like people like, I don't want to hear your excuses. I don't want to hear you be, get, get the job done. Like we don't have time for that. And then also like it couldn't be that way because I was responsible for other people's lives. Mm -hmm. Like I had a huge responsibility, whether it was protecting somebody's life, you know, jumping in front of a bullet to save someone. I had to be capable and able and willing to do that, whether it's arresting somebody, being thoughtful in my actions and making sure I'm not causing harm to anyone but also protecting my environment and my people, or even interviewing people. You know, it was just as important for me to get a confession from someone as it was to clear somebody's name who was being looked at for a crime mm. that they didn't commit so that the wrong person doesn't get accused. Those, are, those held huge responsibilities. And so I had to shed these blaming others, the victim, and that mindset very quickly and take ownership. And once you can get into that space where you own yourself and your decisions, you be, you start to free yourself. Yeah, I know, and I, yeah. It's easier it's, to be like, it's that person's fault, or it's that person's fault. Have you found though, it's easier, but once you make the shift, it's not. Like, I would never give my power away now, ever. But I had to make the shift first to realize how powerful owning stuff is over blaming someone else. I think I like I was very fortunate because I was in an environment for many years like I was in the service almost 13 years and that helped solidify my mindset because I was on around this is why influence is so important like who's around you I was around other strong people granted they were mostly men but you know what I succeeded on the same level you did so I earned my spot so and we respected each other and so because I was around other strong resilient people what did I become? Strong, resilient. Mm -hmm. There's moments where I'm like, ah, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm blaming somebody else. You know, even if that person is wrong, it's like, okay, I can acknowledge this person, not so good. Maybe I won't work with them again or do business with them again or have a friendship with them. But, but again, I, I chose. And even if it's a bad relationship, I've had those where I'm like, I choose not to be here anymore. I have to choose that. Boom. Love that girl. Guys, 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 if you haven't got this woman's book, I've read it three times. That's how much I love it. Go get this woman's book, Becoming Bulletproof. Follow her at Evie Pampers. There it is. Um, guys, if you're not subscribed, click that subscribe button. If you're not following me, follow me at Lisa Bilyeu. And until next time, guys, be the hero of your own life.
Peace out. What up guys, thanks so much for watching this video. If you'd like another dose of bad or arsery, make sure you watch this video right here or this one right here, because I know you'll like them. But hey, also, while you're here guys, you might as well click that subscribe button down there so you don't miss any future episodes. And until next time, be the hero of your own life. Peace out.